you'll notice that thematically in the lyrics, the words of um, today's songs, it talks about Jesus loving us and being our closest friend. And those are the ideas I really want to hit home with today. Uh, I really want to emphasize that. And uh, we'll do a little bit of review from last week, and uh, hopefully that will help uh, just kind of get our mind uh, refreshed in terms of um, where we're coming from, uh, what we're looking at um, with our relationship with God. And uh, so I want to uh, show you a few slides that can uh, maybe bring some, uh, some of these ideas back to mind. Um, one of the things we did was we talked about a clip from, or a quote from Dallas Willard, and he said, not planning to go to London does not help me get to New York. And I like that because even though it sounds really oblique, what he's saying is you can't get closer to God by trying not to sin, or at least that's the way I interpret it in this context. Um, you can't approach God from the negative. Uh, in the same way of, um, if I want to be a good friend to someone, my entire focus can't be, um, I don't want to make them mad. You know, surely that's part of it. You know, you don't want to offend somebody. You don't want to um, get to a point where you say the something that, you know, gets them irritated. Um, but on the other hand, it's bigger than that because it's a matter of um, leaning into that relationship and getting to know the person and um, finding out what it is they like or dislike, finding out what um, what you can do to really lean into um, that sharing, that life sharing. And it sounds really simple. It might even sound, you know, um, like we, we've been here before, we've, we've talked about this, uh, I know all about this kind of stuff. Um, but when we talk to each other, when we talk to other Christians, what I find, um, at least in my experience, is often um, there is a yearning to have some kind of a, a closer relationship with God where we hear his voice more clearly. Or that um, if he doesn't answer our prayer uh, the way we expect him to, what's going on with that? You know, so um, there is this, um, the idea of if I can get to know God a little bit better, perhaps I'll understand him more. And more importantly, if he's going to be the center of my life, perhaps, you know, it, I ought to structure my life around that relationship. Um, take a look at this next slide here. Um, yeah, as I said, simply managing sins does not lead to the abundant life that Jesus promised. So what I want to do um, is get us to a place, myself included, where we are not just looking at what we can eliminate from our life, because that is not enjoyable at all. And if you think about it, that's not our natural way to conduct our lives. Let me think about all the things I can remove. Uh, instead, we like to do things. I like to say we're human doings. We like to, uh, we have our hobbies, we have our, our passions, and those are things we want to lean into. And so we like to do and we don't like to remove. So the question there becomes, if I have a relationship with God that's all about removal, if it's all about the negative, then I'm going to completely miss out on the point of all of it. So um, let's see. Uh, John 17, two through three, this was one of our scriptures. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life. This is our foundational thematic scripture here. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. As Dallas Willard said, that's what the New Testament has to say about eternal life. That's about as far as it goes. There are a few other scriptures that we could point to, and, well, this kind of says we'll be doing this, that, or the other thing. Maybe, possibly, it could be poetic language, but as far as a real definition, it doesn't say this is eternal life, that they may exist forever playing harps on clouds or living in, in mansions that, that you know, the sun will build in heaven because he is the, 
the universe's greatest contractor and he believes in open concept housing and we're all going to have these big places with great carpets. It's nothing like that. Anything more specific than this becomes imagination. It says this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now the implication there is that eternal life starts now. It's not something we wait for later. And too many people who feel like they're uh, Christians, that they have a great relationship with God, uh, I'm not saying they don't, but it tends to be a matter of where we're going to be later rather than can I enjoy this relationship right now? And to me, that's a tragedy because it's missing out on what is life. Again, if my idea of existence is removing things, um, that's a lousy way to live. Life is more about what we do, what we engage in on the positive side. Dallas Willard also said, what does it mean to be saved? It means eternal living here and now, a life of interaction with Jesus here and now, and that's the only description of eternal life in the New Testament. So it is this moment when we're having a church service and we decide to put uh, aside some time for sacred relationship with God. This isn't meant to be, church shouldn't be a classroom. It shouldn't be a time when, you know, I read some scriptures to you and then um, I, I share some thoughts of, of prominent theologians of how to interpret something obscure. And then you walk away saying, oh, well, those are some interesting ideas. Church should be a celebration. It should be, uh, it should be worship in the way that I acknowledge and respect your awesomeness, God. And I want to bathe in that for a while. I want to immerse myself in your presence, uh, in your greatness. That's what worship is about. That's why we get together. Um, you can read scripture on your own. You could read commentaries on your own. But the idea is that we put together time in relationship with each other and with God. And we say, okay, this is a rhythm that we're going to uh, continue to honor. Every Sunday morning, we will get together and together we will declare how wonderful, how truly awesome and inspiring our God is. That's what worship is about. It's not about avoiding um, some signature sin that is a problem for me and may not be for you, and then you've got yours and the next person has the, theirs. Sure, we need to be mindful about living a life representative of Christ. However, if our focus is only on sin removal, we're missing the point. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So here's a simple logical formula. If I believe that Jesus only tells the truth, that in fact he is the truth, that he would never lie, then I have to conclude that his words here are true. So when he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble, you'll find rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. That doesn't square up with the kind of life where, man, it's difficult to stop sinning. Man, it's difficult to get these traits out of my life. It's difficult for me to, to get a hold on the words that I say or my behaviors or my temper or this habit or, you know, I, I indulge too much in this, that, or the other thing. I'm not saying we go crazy with those parts of our life that shouldn't be there. What I'm saying is that's not an easy yoke. That's the kind of thing that makes a mockery of Jesus' words. That's the kind of thing that, that makes me say in my heart, well, yeah, you say that, Jesus, but I really don't feel it. That's because, again, I'm focused on the bad stuff rather than the good of him sharing his life and love with us. And if that were my focus, a lot of the sin stuff just takes care of itself because I am then living the life that 
Jesus would have me live. I'm living as he did so as to emulate him and be more like him. And then that means a lot of that stuff will, will not have the power over me that it otherwise would. We talked about the word genisco and or genosco and how this knowing in these verses is not about just knowing a fact, like I know how many uh, feet are in a mile or I know how many inches are in a yard. You know, it, that those are just facts. This is the kind of knowing when you say, I know that person and they are they are of good character. We've spent time together. I know them. And this is the kind of knowing that Jesus talks about, that they may know you and the one that you've sent. That's the knowing that, that's important here in this verse. So getting to our point for today, we talk about getting to know Jesus. We talk about leaning into that relationship. But the question becomes, how? How do we do that? And to talk about that, I want us to talk a little bit about establishing rhythms. And when I say rhythms, what I'm talking about is practices that help us engage with God in a way that perhaps we haven't uh, systemically or, or customarily done before. Um, maybe we have certain rhythms that work well for us, and then other ones not so much. Um, I want to start right off the bat with this idea of, um, of legalism, and I uh, thought I had a slide for that. I may have put it out of uh, order here. Um, apparently, I missed it. Um, the idea that I wanted to get across is legalism can be a ditch on the side of the road, and it is easy for us to go into the other ditch on the other side. And so... Many of the folks in our particular um, family of faith, um, but it, this goes for many different denominations and, and uh, church associations, um, we have a history of understanding God through the lens of legalism, which means an emphasis on the law, um, an overemphasis on the law. Uh, typically, it was on the old covenant, which is no longer uh, in effect. Jesus said, I give you a new covenant in my blood. Um, so we are under a new covenant, and that law is a law of love. And it doesn't require us to be nitpicky over um, the letter uh, of regulations. It doesn't require us to make lists. What it does ask of us is... To build relationship. Have you ever noticed that each one of us uh, tends to have hot spots? Uh, meaning, don't bring up XYZ with Jack over there because that's a hot spot for him and he will fly off the handle if you bring that up. Maybe it's politics, maybe it's religion, maybe it's you know some aspect of government. Whatever it is, each of us tends to have hot spots. And if you know someone well, you know you don't want to go there. I think most of us who have lived through legalism and in, uh, an overemphasis on law or lawfulness, we tend to have legalism as a hot spot, such that anything that even sounds slightly like it could be legalism then our shields go up, our defenses are up, and we don't even want to have the conversation. The problem is that that can get us into a place where we don't believe in effort anymore. And there's nothing wrong with effort as long as it's not expended to get reward from God. So, we have a system of, that we think of blessing and, and curses that's more of an old covenant kind of a thinking. The way I want us to think now is in terms of if I do the things that are of the family of God, I will then be living rightly and I will enjoy the abundant life that Jesus offers. I don't want to do something just because I will be rewarded or to further secure my place in heaven or the kingdom. Uh, it is not a matter of getting paid for a deed well done. Um, now, God may reward us, 
but we don't want to do anything relationship wise so that we can get a reward. And what I want you to think about is your family, uh, a spouse, a daughter, a son, a, a parent, cousin, best friend, whoever. These are people that you want to spend time with. And these people would never like to think that you were only spending time with them to gain something else. Because then they become a means to an end. I would be hurt if someone were to strike up a relationship with me only because they could use me to get something that I have access to. I have no idea what that might be, but just by, um, by example there. How then might God feel about us seeing him as a means to eternal life and nothing more? If we saw him as only a ticket to a country called the kingdom, that is separated by distance and time, and one day I'll get there. And as long as my ticket is valid and gets punched one day, then that's all I care about. But that's not it at all. The ticket is the relationship, and the kingdom is the place we continue to enjoy that relationship through the rest of eternity. So it's not about getting there. It's about acting the part of being there now and then fully enjoying everything that goes with that later on. The ticket thing comes up an awful lot from what I can tell. So I want to talk about what Jesus typically did um, in a very narrow um, viewpoint. We're going to look at how he often practiced um, solitude, silence, um, and prayer, uh, individual prayer. Not that he never prayed corporately like we do, but um, these were some practices that he continually observed on his own. Uh, so Luke, we're going to be looking at um, Luke and some scriptures from Mark. Um, chapter 5, verses, uh, this is actually from 16. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Now by lonely places, it doesn't mean he found a bar where all the lonely people hung out, but rather he went to a place where there weren't other people. Uh, it might as well say he withdrew to a solitary place um, and, and he prayed. I don't want us to read that and subconsciously think, well, that takes a lot of discipline for him to go out there and force himself to pray. That's the problem. That's the kind of legalistic thinking that I want us all to be able to get away from. Um, he would go and pray because he knew his father. He wanted to spend time with his father. He knew that's what life was all about. And so we also, if we want to be like Jesus, we need to start behaving like him in terms of doing the kinds of things he did. And that's not to say that, that you're not necessarily, but it's the idea of, if we resist any kind of behavior because it seems um, consistent or we say, I'm going to do this frequently, uh, well, that feels like legalism. You could say the same thing about brushing your teeth every day, showering every day, getting dressed. There are certain things we just do because they are a consistent means to an end. It doesn't mean legalism. It just means we know as human beings, we might kind of you know, let things go if we're not careful. So this kind of practice, I can bet you there were mornings when Jesus got up and said, man, I'm tired. I'd rather sleep for a while longer because he was pretty, I'll say busy. He wasn't hurried, but he was busy accomplishing things. And um, I would imagine there were some mornings he woke up and he was pretty tired, but I don't think he forced himself. Well, got to go talk to dad now. I think it's a matter of I'm looking forward to spending time with my father. And that's the relationship I want us to emphasize. Um, here's another one in Mark 1, 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Same idea. Um, Dallas Willard asked this question. We talked about it last week. The question that the evangelist should, should be, if you don't die tonight, what are you going to do tomorrow? The answer should be, I'm going to trust Jesus with all my life, with everything, and that will allow me to live in the kingdom of God. He's contrasting that with the typical idea of an evangelist saying, if you die tonight, where are you going to go? 
Willard is saying, if you live tomorrow, what are you going to do? Again, it's that negative versus the positive. The positive being, how are you going to live in the kingdom? And that's what we're looking at. Intentionally spending time with God. And don't assume that I'm talking about a particular, a particular practice because we'll see a little bit later there's a lot of different ways to spend time with God. Um, Luke 6, verses 12 and 13. Jesus went out on a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him. You know what I like about this verse? It doesn't say Jesus cracked open his copy of the Hebrew Bible. Um, he got to the foot of the bed, kneeled down, and started praying in the way he was taught in school. Um, we tend to think of relating to God under very strict pictures, very strict behaviors. And what I see here is that Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. That's a nice place to go and spend time with God. It doesn't say he found the dumpiest, most desolate piece of wasteland he could find. He went up on the mountaintop. That's a nice place to spend time with God. A lot of people that I talk to really enjoy nature, and that's where they feel closer to God. That makes a lot of sense. That looks kind of like what Jesus did as well. Go to a place that's inspiring. Go to a place that uh, resonates with you, that lifts your thoughts up and says, this is a connection place with God. I like to say I get better reception outside when it comes to listening to God. Um, but it's a matter of just being outdoors is often very inspiring and helpful. Um, so that's something that we see Jesus himself doing. Uh, Mark 6, verses 31 and 32, it says, Because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to his disciples, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. So Jesus isn't just thinking about his own well-being, his own um, potential to rest. He's thinking about the humanity of the folks that are with him, and he's very aware that they need rest too. So here's a bit of an argument for Sabbath time. And again, if I bring up Sabbath, that can create this uh, resistance. Oh no, don't start talking about the Sabbath again. I, I, I've tried that. I've been there, done that for many years. I don't want to go there again. That's not what we're talking about. That's the other side of the ditch where you do it to gain favor with God. You do it to get that ticket to get you into heaven. This is the kind of rest that we do so that that yoke is easy, that burden is light, so that it's about spending time with God and refreshing rather than going crazy, chasing our tails and trying to check off boxes of holiness. Matthew 14, 23, after Jesus had dismissed the crowds, he went up upon a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was still there alone. Again, I don't want us to read that as if, wow, that's a lot of discipline. I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't make it more than 10 or 15 minutes. Well, maybe so. It depends on what you're used to with talking to God. If you get used to five minutes, pretty soon 10 minutes isn't much of a stretch. You get used to 10 minutes and maybe 15 or 20 isn't much of a stretch. This is something where I really believe he did because he wanted to spend time with his father. Yes, it was an example for us, but I can almost guarantee you, actually, I'll go ahead and say I can guarantee you, it's not something he did out of obligation. And to me, our time with God should never be done out of obligation. Sometimes we might have to drag ourselves out of bed because as human beings, we may not want to get up um, out of the, the comfortable bed and start the day. So there's going to be a little bit of effort there, but it shouldn't be something that we do because we have to. It should be something that we believe in God as a lover of our soul and we want to spend time with him. Matthew 15, 29, Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on the mountainside and sat down there. You see the solitude here, and again, it's on a mountainside. 
It's a matter of I'm not only going to, going to get away from the crowds, but I'm going to get some elevation. And there's something about seeing things from a, a height, especially, you know, I don't want you to think if you're afraid of heights to think of on top of a building, but on a hill, you know, on, on anything that gives you a little bit of elevation tends to make the whole world look different. If you've ever been on a plane and as you're taking off and you look down, the world looks different because you now have literally an eagle eye view and you can see all of the, the people and the houses and the cars, they kind of look like ants around ant hills. And you get this perspective of, wow, each one of those people, just like myself, thinks that whatever they're doing is the most important thing in the world. And they don't realize that there's 7 billion other people who are thinking the same thing. And you get this big picture of the globe and you start to feel like this is what God sees. And it's a whole different perspective. So just getting yourself up on a hillside or, you know, that kind of altitude makes a huge difference. So I think you understand where I'm going with that. Mark 9, verse 2. Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up high on a mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. Admittedly, this verse is about the transfiguration, much bigger topic. But notice that he took them alone, went away up on a mountain. And there's some significance there because it brings to mind Moses and the Israelites. But they went away by themselves, got some altitude, got away. That is a serious spiritual practice that can benefit all of us. Now, I'm not suggesting you go find the nearest mountain and climb it every day, but I think you understand the, the general concept here. Matthew 14, verse 13. When Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. To me, that speaks to the need for personal meditation to say, you know what, I've got to process this and I'm going to do it with God. I'm going to not stew on my own feelings and say, God, how could you do this? How could you let this happen? Uh, I'll talk to him about it. God, how could you do this? How could you let this happen? And if I'm used to listening for his answers, I may feel inspired to think in a certain way, or I might, if I have scripture with me, I might see certain things in scripture that answer me. Uh, I might have a um, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to me directly to answer my questions. All those things are much more likely if we're used to listening for God's voice. So prayer, solitude, and silence tended to be um, very common spiritual rhythms uh, for Jesus. So to that end, um, as promised, I want to talk about, kind of give an overview of some rhythms that are p available to us. And when I say rhythms, uh, I'm referring to what are traditionally called spiritual disciplines. But I want to avoid the word discipline because, again, we have a sensitivity to that. It, it sounds forced. It sounds done as an assignment. But a rhythm to me is more like what we call a routine. You know, you have your morning routine. A spiritual rhythm is a spiritual routine that works for you because your routine for things doesn't work well for anybody else. So I want to talk about these spiritual um, rhythms that we can adopt for ourselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a different screen and uh, hopefully um, you'll get a a perspective on the concepts I'm trying to describe here and uh, bring that up on your screen in just a moment. Hopefully this will work. Bear with me just a moment. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. All right, so hopefully you can see this screen. Uh, I'm going to adjust the size of it just a bit. There we go. So I'm going to zoom in a bit. And um, if you can't see that, um, please send me a, a note in the chat or something. But hopefully you can see the screen. It looks like it's sharing. Um, this is something that you learn in Psychology 101. Uh, the idea that there are many facets to human life. And these are all things we have to consider to live a balanced existence as 
uh, physical human beings. So we have the social dimension, the physical dimension, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And counselors are often taught, or psychologists, um, they're often taught that you need to be going into each of these areas to make sure that a person isn't sabotaging themselves um, in a fundamental way. So maybe someone's depressed, but that may not be a psychological or a mental issue. It may be because they just aren't getting enough sleep. So to that end, it's a matter of um, the physical. So I'm going to expand that just a bit. And you can see, well, the physical can have to do with many different things. It can mean, are you getting enough exercise? How are your muscle strength? How's your muscle tone? Um, are you flexible enough to be able to reach for things or bend for things? Um, how is your agility? You know, if you start to trip, you know, can you catch yourself? Uh, are you getting enough fresh air, which can be hard when you're wearing a mask, I understand, but uh, not impossible. Um, vital signs, you know, is your heart healthy? Is your, are your lungs okay? Um, your blood pressure, all of that. Uh, and again, like I said, but how's your sleep? Because that's a, that is a foundational issue for each of us. We can't really hit the rest of the things on this circle if the physical isn't addressed. So that's something that uh, is just basic. The social part. Well, there's a lot to do to, um, there are a lot of components to our social wellness. Uh, do we have some close friends that we can share life with? Uh, do we meet new people occasionally? Um, are we able to listen to others? Uh, can we connect well with other people? Do we relate? Do we have empathy? Um, do we have regular contact or are we isolated? Uh, are we able to articulate and share our ideas and then receive input and uh, consider the other people's ideas with some fairness rather than just shooting down everything they say? These are all social skills that are important, and if we're lacking some of those, it affects our social wellness. And what about mental? How is that different um, than emotional? Well, by mental... What I'm thinking of is your ability to learn, uh, remember, imagine, solve problems, and reason well. And again, these are issues that can be affected by the physical. So if I'm not getting enough sleep, my memory is going to suffer. Um, my reasoning ability is going to suffer. Um, all of these things are interdependent, but our mental wellness is important because it contributes, of course, to our spiritual and our social and emotional. And lastly, let's look at the emotional wellness. Well, are we generally happy? Are we adjusted to uh, the life that we live uh, and our responsibilities? Can we balance them? Uh, can we handle stress effectively? Um, are we able to, say, have a conversation without flying off the handle because someone hit one of our uh, hot spots? You know, that each of us has triggers. That's really the word I should be using is we have triggers and we can easily be triggered um, accidentally by someone else. And if we're aware of our trigger spots, sometimes we can say, wait a minute, before I get upset about this, I realize this is a trigger for me and I'm just going to let it go. And that's a sign of emotional intelligence or emotional maturity. So I'm just skimming over some of these things, but here's what I really wanted to look at today. With spiritual life, we're looking at two things, right? We talk about what is it that God wants of us? Well, he wants us to love him and he wants us to love other people. Well, that's great, but be specific. How am I going to do those things? Yes, I could do something for my neighbor, but it's 106 degrees outside and I'd really rather do something that doesn't have me melting on the sidewalk. So, you know, how can we love others? And what do you mean by loving God? Well, I'm glad you asked because I've got this map here and I want you to write them all down, take them down quickly because I'm sure you can read all these words on your little screen. Um, these are actually um, a set of rhythms that come from that book I showed you the cover of a minute ago in the slide there. Um, these are spiritual rhythms or, or things that we can do to approach God in a way that's meaningful. Now, I've intentionally showed all of them on the screen not to be overwhelming, but rather, um, oh, hopefully, I'm sorry. You are not seeing my screen, are you? I'll see if I can do this differently. There, hopefully that's better. Okay. Um, 
So just to back up a bit, um, all of these together might look overwhelming, but the point is, this is like a spiritual buffet. I'll get into detail in a minute, but if your idea of a good time with God is not kneeling down at the foot of the bed, cracking open the Bible at 5.30 in the morning or 4.30 or whatever it needs to be, then that's not what you should do. If it is burdensome to you, if it's something that you hate, if it's something that you are going to drag into your life with God that is going to make you resistant, don't do that. It's the old doctor joke. Doctor, it hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that. And it's the same thing with our spiritual rhythms. If there's a particular behavior that doesn't work for you, or a particular rhythm, I should say, a particular way of relating to God, that's probably not for you. It doesn't fit with your makeup. It doesn't fit with the way that God designed you to be. But for example, um, let's take a look at prayer itself. So I'll zoom in a little bit here. And some of this might sound silly. That's fine. Maybe those aren't for you. Um, but some of them might sound intriguing. So for example, uh, I'm just going to read through the list. Welcoming prayer, prayer walking. I like that one. Uh, prayer of recollection, prayer, or praying scripture, prayer partners, a prayer of lament, uh, liturgical prayer. And some of you, I, I, can I can feel the vibes. You're thinking, uh oh, this sounds legalistic, but Stick with me. These are options. Um, listening prayer, one of my favorites, the kind where you, you talk to God and you listen for the small voice, you listen for a response. Um, labyrinth prayer, it's an outdoor activity. Uh, intercessory prayer, we do that all the time. Inner healing prayer, fixed hour prayer. That's kind of a, a thing where it's a matter of if I don't set a time on my watch to remind me to pray, you know, uh, at lunchtime or, you know, right after I get home or whatever, it's a reminder way of I, I pray at this time every day because otherwise it'll just slip through and I don't want that to happen. Um, fasting, a big favorite for everyone always. Everyone loves fasting. Um, conversational prayer, contemplative prayer, centering prayer, breath prayer. Um, even the act of breathing itself can be an act of worship. That's not what the breath prayer is about. Um, we've reviewed some of these in a discipleship class a while back. But these are, what is, that's about a dozen different types of prayer. Um, likewise, um, hearing God's word. Well, there's memorization, which many of us have done in the past. Um, maybe uh, you like to go through Psalms or Proverbs and see if you can remember them. Um, Maybe that's not your thing. Meditation. I will think, I will meditate on your word day and night, we read. Um, the idea of I'm going to read a scripture and I'm just going to think about it. And I'm going to ask myself, does, how does this apply to my life right now? Uh, Lectio Divina or devotional reading. I'm going to read a particular passage of scripture and I'm going to hear what uh, God has to say to me about that. Um, Let's see, um, Bible study, pretty familiar with that, most of us. Um, incarnate the word of Christ. This is just this author's way of making categories. Um, Truth-telling, stewardship, solidarity in Jesus' sufferings, justice. To me, that's a big one. I really, I'm, I'm built for justice for some reason. Uh, humility, forgiveness, control of the tongue, compassion, care of the earth, blessing others, and encouragement. Um, sharing life with others, having an accountability partner, chastity, community, covenant groups, discipling, face-to-face -face connection. That's a challenge for us, but you can do video conferences and it's almost as good. Um, hospitality, mentoring, service. Now, this tends to be one of the celebrities of spiritual rhythms that doesn't have to get all of the attention. If you don't do something specifically for your neighbor every day, that's not a sin. Maybe that kind of act of service is not uh, something you're really built for. Maybe you make them a card or you pick up groceries for them or whatever. Um, or something else here on the list it appeals to you in a way to relate to God. Um, small groups, spiritual friendships, that's really big. We'll be talking about that in the future, about how you and I meet every so often to talk about our relationship with God. We're open and honest, and no one's forced to say anything or share anything, but we can talk about those things that are most important. Unity and witness, 
Um, relinquishing the false self. This is a whole other area. And uh, again, don't be overwhelmed by all of this. Um, in no way am I saying we need to be familiar with and execute each one of these things. Again, this is like a spiritual practice buffet. That one sounds good to me. I think that one I could do well. That one sounds crazy. I don't want any part of that one. That's fine. But these are all practices that have been meaningful to Christianity throughout centuries. Um, confession and self-examination, detachment, discernment, mindfulness, secrecy, that means the ability to keep something private. Um, silence, we saw lots of scriptures where Jesus was practicing silence. Sobriety, solitude, spiritual direction, working with someone who helps you hear God's voice, very important. Um, submission and waiting. And a lot of us are familiar with waiting, but it's an idea of how we do the waiting. Um, opening ourselves to God through contemplation, examine, iconography, means looking at certain religious paintings and or Christian, Christian paintings, icons they're called, and examining all of the implications. That there's a lot of theology packed into Christian icons, and it's a whole field. Um, journaling, pilgrimage, going to some place that's significant. If you've ever gone to Israel uh, to visit the Holy Land, then that was a pilgrimage. Um, practicing the presence, remembering that God is with you all the time, no matter if you're taking out the garbage or doing the dishes, and leaning into that and saying, God, thanks that I didn't trip over that rock when I was taking out the trash, because that was a close one. That's part of practicing the presence. Uh, rest, retreat, self-care, simplicity, slowing. We're talking about slowing uh, every week in our discipleship class. Teachability, that's a huge one right now. I'm going to leave that alone. Um, unplugging. And lastly, uh, right up here with worship, celebration, gratitude, holy communion, a rule of life, which means basically an outline of the rhythms that work best for you. Um, Sabbath, Visio Divina, which is kind of like looking at an image and then hearing what God can speak to you about through that image. The same way as, um, as uh, scripture or anything else, God can speak through a donkey so he can speak through anything. Um, and regular worship like we do on, uh, on Sunday mornings. So anyway, again, this is not to overwhelm. I'd be happy to provide a list uh, or give a link to this book. Um, there's many books on spiritual rhythms. Please hear the point I'm trying to make. If you have not yet found a way to relate to God that you enjoy, that brings joy to you, that brings you closer to him, that if you haven't found something that makes it something you look forward to, then there's probably something else that you could do that you would enjoy, that does work for your temperament, um, that would speak to your soul in a way that the other things don't. So that, that's what these collections are about. How can I build my life around deliberately spending time with God in a way that furthers our relationship and doesn't hinder it and doesn't go off into the ditch of legalism? So I hope that makes some sense. Um, we're going to go back to our slides. As I mentioned, um, this was the book that I was referring to, but there are many different books. Uh, we used this as a bit of a, a handbook when we were going through our discipleship class. It's called the Spiritual Disciplines Handbook. Feel free to substitute discipline for rhythm or practice whenever you like. Um, so that's the idea today.